Hello, I'm David D. Hill. So I am a critical thinker, dissident scientist, and I'm here to tell you the truth about science. Something your university professors won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you, and certainly those science evangelists won't tell you. As promised, this is my second video in a series of three about how we don't need dark matter. The first one was with Cameron Wong and his amazing paper about the Newtonian gravi gravity versus dark matter. And he showed that you can use just simple Newtonian gravity equations to calculate that you don't need dark matter. Why? Because he looks at the geometry of what galaxies are. There's a very dense center and there are arms and he goes and calculates it and boy does he do a lot of calculations. So if you're that in that bent it is a great explanation but the upshot is it's not a point mass. You can't just put a point in the middle, put all the mass of the galaxy there, and then measure speeds of, of stars and expect them to be the same. Well, we've got a second explanation that's very similar. The only difference that the model being used and the calculations being used are different because it's using a particle model. Particle model is simple. It's a graviton model, meaning gravity, space, time, which isn't bending or anything. Gravity fields are made of G1 particles flying in all directions, and you get this shadowing effect that makes attraction, etc., etc. Not here to talk about that, but we're, we're here to talk about another explanation of why we don't need dark matter. And who's this by? The particle guru himself, Robert D. Hilster, my father. Yes, my father. And if you haven't seen his uh, channel, you should check it out. It is the Particle Guru. You can get to it at youtube.particle.guru. That's http colon slash slash youtube.particle.guru. Subscribe. He's got great. He doesn't come up with a lot of videos, maybe once a week, but they are great. He prepares a lot for them. So we're going to take a look at his video in, in three distinct places to give you an idea of how he goes about showing that dark matter is not needed. He also gives a great, you want to watch the whole thing. I'm only going to show you a piece of it. I'm not going to show you the pieces about the explanation for dark matter, why they came up with it, etc. I'm going to show you the highlights, but you definitely want to watch. It's only 22 minutes long. Well worth the effort and watch. Hello, my name is Bob D. Hilster, and I am your particle model guru. Today I'm going to talk about dark matter and why it's not needed. I'm going to compare that to G, the gravitational constant, and see which one, dark matter or G, might be the answer. Now, this becomes a problem because when mainstream when scientists measure the velocity of the stars at the edge of the galaxy they get a number that is too high compared to their calculated number now this is a typical graph one i'll be using throughout it has a vertical axis which has the velocity in kilometers per second it has a horizontal axis which is in light years and it, right here uh, on here is shown where our solar system is, how far it is from the core. It looks like about 24,000 light years. The blue curve is the measured values, the uh, typical measured values. The red curve is the calculated values using the Keplerian uh, equations. Measured values too high calculated values too low, there's a problem. So there are other graphs just like that. You can see this one from Arizona State Uni Arizona University. And it plots a blue line just about the same way. Uh, but you can see some of the dots it used and how it, it weaved the line through these dots, uh, depicting a typical value, even though the measured values vary around that. Here's one from Ohio State. It, uh, it, that green line looks basically flat, and there's the red line, which is the Keplerian prediction. But even with the green line, if you look, you can see that it's moving up and down, but uh, uh, that's the way they plotted it. So you can pick and choose which graph you want to look at. I picked the first one and move forward with that one. 
So you see that they're plotting the graph. The real velocity looks like this wave, and he even points out in the one, they know they sort of just put a line through it, but it turns out this wave's going to have some really important, important meaning. It's going to be an important explanation. It's going to be a big clue. Well, I'm going to let my dad tell you about it. Let's go forward to about 6.30 here and see what he has to say. Regardless, particle model uses G1 gravity gravity one. So we're going to explain this curve and I'm going to use, explain it by looking at this picture. In this picture of our galaxy, the graphic, the yellow part is the core and coming off of one edge of the core is one major arm and coming off the other edge of the core is another major arm. We have minor arms in between uh, there and another one here but for the analysis, I'm going to only concentrate on the core, the first arm, and the second arm. In this graphic, there is a polar grid whose center is located right here. and is located right on our solar system. And what you'll see is as you go from the core through the first arm, you then between the first arm and that second major arm, these are major arms, is our solar system right there. Okay, so we have this image now of the galaxy as a core and two major arms. So now I'm going to walk you through this blue line visualizing the galaxy using the blue line. Okay, so again we have the velocity in kilometers per second. We have the distance in light years and this is the location of the sun which is in between the first arm and the second arm. And so let me show you how we get there. At the core, the velocity of the objects right at the center of the core is zero. This is much like if you take the Earth, my hand, and you're standing on the North Pole, even though the Earth spins, your velocity is almost zero. Okay, at the edge of the Earth, it's very high, much higher. And that's what you have here. You have the velocity at the center of the core going up to a peak at the edge of the core. So this represents the velocity through the core out to the edge where you have a peak of around 250 kilometers per second. This is the gap between the core and the first arm. And it tends to drop very much like uh, R one over R squared. If, if you could take this curve, put it over here, and just draw another curve moving down. And that's what it would do. So this is dropping like R squared. Then it reaches the arm and then it increases. This is the first arm. Then it falls after the first arm. We reach our, our solar system right here. And then this drops. Now this doesn't drop as much, presumably because there's more mass out there, more objects. And as a consequence, it's a compromise between dropping like R squared and moving up, but it's, it drops. And then this is the second arm. And then from there on, you're outside the galaxy. So this is truly amazing. When my father first showed me, I just fell off my chair. What, is, what, what do we see here? The velocities follow the exact geometry of the galaxy. Oh my word, why didn't they see this? Why didn't they pay attention to that? Why didn't they see that this, the velocities, are a result and depends on the geometry of the galaxy? This is a huge clue, and my father knows this. And for that, he actually calculates it. So we're going to go ahead here to 1420. Again, last time it took me forever to get there, but I'm going to get that close enough, and we'll take a look what he explains. It happens. So the G is the one that changes. So I take their equation, standard equation for velocity, and G is now varying over the, over the galaxy. The value of G is greater at the edge. In fact, G varies with its location, and it is not constant. Particle model says the g is not constant. Now, I can actually use the blue curve. Interesting point, I can use the blue curve to calculate the value of g at any point. 
I rearranged the equation that uh, I squared the uh, the the velocity and rearranged it, <coughs> and you come up with this equation where the value of g at any point is equal to the square of its velocity times the distance divided by the mass of the galaxy. So I'm going to calculate that. I took this curve. Now, admittedly, I don't have data points. Somebody had data points to begin with, and then they plotted this curve as a typical value, not a precise value, a typical one. So this has already been adjusted from the true data. They took that and they plotted this. Then I took this, I made a hard copy, put a grid over it, and I read off of this data points. So that at each at each distance I picked a a velocity off of the chart. Pick the distance, check got the velocity. That's a manual thing. So I don't have the raw data. I'm using somebody else's estimate of what the blue curve is, and then I'm doing a manual read. This makes it pretty iffy, but kind of interesting to try and do. When I replot those using a spreadsheet, this is what I get. It's kind of a piecewise linear approximation. You see it's a straight line here. Uh, there's two straight lines here, and each one of these a little chunk is a straight line. But you can see generally it has, but behind this curve are data points, specific velocities at specific distances. Then I used those data points. I used those data points to calculate the value of g at any given uh, distance. Wow. Now you may say, oh, well, he's just, plot, he's just uh, fitting the curve. No. What's happening is, listen to what's happening, because if you don't know the particle model, the particle model says that g is a constant here on Earth because of the gravitational field we're in. What, what the particle model tells us is that depending on where we are and what mass is around, especially in the galaxies, we have a weakening and, and strengthening gravitational field because those G1 particles would push everything around and causes us two things to attract because the shadowing effect, that changes. And it changes with what? The geometry, where the mass is in the galaxy. Wow. So... What happens? This is a very stunning conclusion. And let's take a look at what my father concludes here at 1940. Uh, take a look at this. Quite, quite amazing. The, the dark matter, but much greater than the, uh, see, because 5% uh, of this is visible matter. 5%. Divide this by 19 or 20. And you get a, a smaller number, but still uh, very large. But because of the particle model and the fact that it loses force as it goes through, you don't need as much mass. Smaller number is expected. Whether that number is even right, I don't know. Don't know if it's right or not. Conclusion. Mainstream picked the wrong term in the equation. They picked M as something that had to increase, and they invented dark matter. And they did not explain the blue curve one bit. The particle model suggests that the force of gravity changes as you move from the core to the edge of the galaxy. And as a consequence, if you're going to use Newton's equation or Keplerian equation, you must you have to change g as you go through the galaxy. And g is not neither universal nor is it a constant. And the model actually predicts the blue curve, which mainstream doesn't even talk about. It's wow, wow, and more wow. That blows my mind. Here's a way to think of it. This is an analogy I can give you. you oh, wow, how can G change? That doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. Gravity changes. Hmm, if I go to Mars, does gravity change? Yes, it does. Do I get near the sun? Does gra is gravity on the sun? higher than on the Earth? Yes, it is. Imagine that the galaxy is a big, giant, huge planet, dense planet in the middle. Yeah, as you get closer to that, does the gravity field change? Yes, it does. The gravitational constant is not 
the same. And what this says is, is that curve which no one seems to pay attention to that curve, which shows exactly the physicality and the shape and the, si the, the entire mass distribution of a galaxy also gives us clues as to why and what happens with just regular Newtonian gravity. So there you have it, folks, a second explanation. You really want to take a look at this. I have the link below. W watch the entire thing. Like I said, my father explains dark matter in a really easy way. My father is, has this amazing and uncanny ability to take something that seems very complex and make it simplify to something that is down to its essence. That's my father's gift to the world. You should subscribe to him. Again, the Particle Guru. Just go to Particle uh, dot guru no com they got new gurus now and we hope to have some more people more people on our channels coming up with you and of course i have the third coming in the series which is a totally different explanation from dr glenn borker one of the best philosophy if not the scientific philosophy philosopher of our generation and he has another explanation as to why dark matter, dark energy is not needed. So remember, don't take my word for it. Don't take my father's word for it. Take a look at his video. Look at what he's talking about. Look at the data. Look at his calculations. Look at Cameron Wong's calculations and make it up. Make up your own mind. Don't take anything that I say or anybody else says on faith. Stay critical. Stay thinking. I am David D. Hilster, your science therapist. Ciao for now. Hey, this is David D. Hilser. Be sure to check out the other YouTube channels of the Critical Thinkers. My father, the Particle Guru, he's got some great videos there where he talks about why you don't need, for instance, dark matter. And we have the king of special relativity, the Critical Thinker, the guy, and that's the nick of time. You want to check him out right here? You can see him right there. Click on them, subscribe to them. You won't regret it. You, these guys are great, and they will make you think.